fever, jutting pustules filled with an opaque and turbid fluid, blisters rubbing against bed sheets, forming rashes, outer layers of skin detaching from the underlying flesh, blindness, death. For centuries, this was the dreadful ending for millions around the world, the symptoms of an illness that killed with the same fierceness a prince or a peasant, the rich and the poor, smallpox. But one day, the unlikeliest of beasts gave one man the inspiration and hope to defeat this killer once and for all. And this beast was none other than the humble cow. Yes, cows are central to a breakthrough that saved millions of lives around the world. Vaccines. Welcome to Intrigued Mind and join us today as we look into one of the craziest stories in the history of science. The first vaccine. In ancient India, 1500 years before the common era, we find the oldest evidence of variola, the virus that triggers smallpox disease. The medical records of smallpox tell a history of death that spans about 3,000 years into the past. It existed in ancient China in 1122 BCE, and even the mummy of Ramesses V, who died in 1145 BC, shows traces of it. A smallpox outbreak was a source of fear for every community that experienced it. It was not only death, but the painful symptoms and shocking skin transformation that horrified people. The Yoruba religion in West Africa held that it was a punishment from the god Sapona. The Hindu goddess of smallpox, Shitala, was worshipped in temples throughout India around 700 BCE. The first serious attempt to fight smallpox occurred in China. Medical writings describe that the virus affected people in different degrees and that the survivors did not contract the disease again. With this knowledge, they developed a treatment technique consisting of inhaling smallpox scabs. As disgusting as it sounds, this form of transmission increased the chances of activating only a mild version of the disease. The unorthodox treatment allowed patients to avoid severe symptoms and achieve immunity, causing mortality rates to drop considerably. The Chinese technique took a long time to be accepted and developed. The reasons are plain. The inhaling of infected scabs was not an easy treatment to sell, to say it mildly. But the concept of inhaling the scabs evolved into a more controlled procedure. Patients were now inoculated with infected pus, obtaining similar and even better results. The procedure was called variolation. However, the results were sometimes fatal. Two or three percent of those variolated died of smallpox. And what's more, variolated individuals could pass the disease on to others. Despite the risks, variolation tests showed improvement in the mid-term. Two is better than the 20 and even 30% of fatalities from contracting smallpox naturally. These unorthodox techniques laid the groundwork for one of the major breakthroughs in medical history, immunology. In 18th century Europe, the disease was a huge problem. 400,000 people died from it yearly, and one third of the survivors went blind. The English called smallpox the speckled monster because of the countless pustules that sick people could develop and the speckled skin left behind on survivors. The virus was worse than ever. The case fatality rate varied from 20% to 60% and left most survivors with disfiguring scars. The case fatality rate in infants was even higher. Several attempts were made to develop a treatment. The English doctor Thomas Sydenham, for example, observed that the rich seemed to have a higher mortality rate from smallpox than the poor. He treated patients by simulating a poor environment. He would intentionally expose them to cold, produce bleeding, provide dirty bedding, and encourage alcohol abuse. As you can imagine, this didn't work, and it was probably the subjection of this kind of treatment that made the rich have the worst experience. Scientists based in Istanbul sent evidence in 1714 and 1716 to the Royal Society of London regarding the effectiveness of the Asian variolation method. 
However, these reports did not change the ways of England's conservative physicians. That is, until they were subjected to fierce pressure from a rather unexpected person. Lady Mary Wortley, an English aristocrat from London, was a beautiful and healthy woman until she contracted smallpox. The disease disfigured her face and killed her beloved 20-year-old brother. After the tragedy, her husband, Edward Wortley, was appointed ambassador of the Sublime Porte. Throughout communication with the Ottoman Empire court, she discovered that variolation was successfully performed on the women of the Sultan's harem, among other people. Lady Mary was determined to use this technique to protect her children. She forced the embassy surgeon Charles Maitland to inoculate her five-year-old son, Edward Wortley Montague. Then, upon their return to London in April 1721, Lady Wortley had Charles Maitland inoculate her four-year-old daughter in the presence of physicians of the royal court. Variolation attempts were performed on criminals, then orphans, and finally on the daughters of the Princess of Wales. After the latter, the procedure gained general acceptance. People of all classes and walks of life demanded protection against smallpox, and variolation became massive. Nonetheless, this technique still has some severe downsides. Before germ theory and proper desterilization, the procedure counterproductively increased the spread of other diseases, like tuberculosis, syphilis, and other infections. However, with no other options available, the government used the procedure to protect its population. In 1757, thousands of children were inoculated. The procedure proved effective. The children developed only mild cases of smallpox and were subsequently immune to the disease. One of the boys was about to take a major part in the disease's history and modern medicine. His name was Edward Jenner. Edward Jenner was born on May 17, 1749 in Berkeley, Gloucestershire. At the age of five, Jenner's father died, orphaning him and his older brother. Since his early years, Edward developed a strong interest in science, and at the age of 13, he was apprenticed to a country surgeon and apothecary in Sodbury, near Bristol. It was there that Edward heard something that would stay with him for years to come. A milkmaid was gloating that she would never have an ugly, pockmarked face since she had already contracted cowpox and was therefore immune. Indeed, it was commonly believed for some strange and unexplained reason, milkmaids were somehow protected from smallpox. Jenner pursued his studies and at 21 became a student of John Hunter, a respected surgeon, biologist, anatomist and experimental scientist from London. Like his father, Edward became a multifaceted scientist with broad interests, even extending into natural science. His skills and personality made him a famous doctor in Berkeley. He also took part in local medical groups, played the violin, and even wrote light verse and poetry. Finally, 1796 was the year when this charismatic doctor made his first step to eradicate the scourge of humankind, inspired by that particular story linking cows and smallpox. Why in the world are milkmaids immune to smallpox? Do the cows have something that makes people resistant to smallpox? The answer to this question was another disease, cowpox. A common condition among milkmaids was an infection that developed pustules on their hands. It was, in fact, a much milder version of the deadly smallpox. The severity of the symptoms varied so greatly that it was hard to believe that there was any relation between both diseases. For a scientific mind like Jenner's, the milkmaid's miracle had a scientific answer. He found a young milkmaid called Sarah Nelms, who had the smallpox disease. He extracted pus from her lesions and following the variolation concept, inoculated an eight-year-old boy called James Phipps. The boy developed mild fever and discomfort in the armpit. Nine days after the procedure, he felt cold and lost his appetite, but he felt much better the following day. In July 1796, Jenner took an incredible risk and purposefully infected the eight-year-old boy with smallpox, 
while an experiment like this would certainly not fly under the rules and regulations of the FDA, it led to one of the greatest medical breakthroughs in human history. After being inoculated with pus from a fresh smallpox lesion, James didn't develop the disease, and Edward concluded that cowpox exposure provided the protection. Edward Jenner sent his observations to the Royal Society, but his paper was rejected due to lack of real scientific evidence. In 1798, he privately published a small book entitled An Inquiry into the Causes and Effects of the Varioli Vaccinae. He decided to honor the cows, drawing on their Latin name Vasa, to call his procedure vaccination. He received mixed reactions from the medical community and found no volunteers for further vaccination. However, that same year, the procedure was lifted to public acclaim when a prestigious surgeon called Henry Klein underwent Jenner's vaccination. Jenner followed up on each patient with the vaccine and conducted a national survey that confirmed his theory. The use of vaccination spread rapidly across England and had reached most European countries by 1800. Edward Jenner sent the vaccine procedure to his medical acquaintances and anyone else who requested it, without charging a single penny. He devoted himself to this cause with such passion that his private practice and family budget suffered terribly as a result. He was attacked and mocked by contemporary scientists. Physician William Rowley made an outrageous claim that the vaccine caused a boy to take on a cow's features. But series after series of successful inoculation cases caused Jenner's ideas to survive. Finally, in 1802, Jenner received the recognition he deserved. The British Parliament awarded him with £30,000 that would today would be equivalent to $1 million. In 1840, the practice of variolation was forbidden in England, making the vaccine the officially recognized treatment to prevent smallpox. In 1855, vaccination became mandatory, and maybe from this moment is when vaccination hesitancy started. Old stories of variolation and smallpox disease and the nature of the vaccination itself encourage particular theories among people until nowadays. Now we know that the cowpox virus belongs to the orthopox family. The reason cowpox worked for Jenna is due to the genetic relation between that virus and human smallpox. The breakthrough of the first vaccine opened a whole new field of study, immunology. The vaccine represented the single greatest promise of biomedicine, disease prevention. Nowadays, there are several types of vaccine in use. They represent different strategies used to reduce the risk of illness while retaining the ability to induce a beneficial immune response. If you ask a public health professional to draw up a top 10 list of humanity's medical achievements, he or she would be hard-pressed not to rank the development of immunization first. Even with modern vaccines and their development, 300 million people died from smallpox in the 20th century. But the efforts of the scientific and international community via the WHO paid off. The last recorded case was in 1978, making smallpox the only human disease ever to be eradicated. The vaccine concept helped develop other treatments for diseases like cholera, anthrax, plague, tuberculosis, tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, polio, measles, mumps and rubella, to name a few. The development of vaccines has saved countless lives over the past two centuries, in addition to significantly increasing our life expectancy. The production of safe and effective vaccines is not always easy. The business involved in the process is all too often a source of controversy and mistrust. The historical record shows that development of vaccines has consistently involved sizable doses of ingenuity, political skill and irreproachable scientific methods. If one of these features is lacking or perceived to be lacking, public trust and two centuries of medical evolution could be at risk. The coronavirus outbreak showed how important vaccines are, since a return to normality rests on its very production. At this point, the scientific idea which arose from cows and milkmaids 
is still our best chance to overcome the threat of pandemics. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video, and leave your suggestion in the comments below.